All right, it is 12 o'clock, so we are going to get started. As a reminder, you should have received a copy of the slides in your reminder email yesterday and the email from about an hour ago. Um, today's webinar will be recorded and available online within a week. Your CDR CEU certificate will be shared in the follow-up email tomorrow. This webinar is still pending one CME credit from the American Academy of Family Physicians. And so for all the physicians on the line, I will contact you with their certificate once it's accepted. And lastly, if you have questions, please use the Q&A window in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to questions at the end. Right. So um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Megan Maizano and I'm the Director of Nutrition and Regulatory Affairs at National Dairy Council and I will be moderating this session. Um, for those of you who have joined us before, welcome back. It's good to be with you again. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. It's so nice to have you and we're glad you're here. Uh, we really love our webinar series and hope you enjoyed today's topic on culinary nutrition for heart health from science to plate. So I am delighted to be joined by Amy Myrtle Miller. Amy is an award-winning dietitian, farmer's daughter, president of Farmer's Daughter Consulting, and co-author of the cookbook, Cooking a la Heart. Prior to starting her consulting business in 2014, Amy worked for Fleischmann Hillard, Dole Food Company, the California Walnut Board and Commission, the Col and the Culinary Institute of America. Today, Amy works with a variety of clients across the food system, including seed, seed companies, grower cooperatives, marketing orders, commodity boards, and campus dining operations, as well as restaurants. Amy is a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, a former president of the California Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and a past chair of the Food and Culinary Professionals Dietary Practice Group. She is currently serving as the treasurer for the Sacramento chapter of Les Dames de Escoffier International. A farmer's daughter from North Dakota who now lives in Carmichael, California, Amy received her BS in dietetics from the University of California, Davis, completed her dietetic internship at the University of Minnesota Hospital and Clinics, and earned her MS in nutrition communication from the Tufts University Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. So we are definitely in good hands today. So here are our disclosures from National Dairy Council. And let's get started with just a brief background. So um, why are we talking about heart health? As many of us know, heart health continues to be a critical public health topic in the United States. When we talk about cardiovascular disease, we're referring to a general term for conditions that affect our heart or blood vessels. These can include coronary artery disease, heart attack, heart failure, stroke, and high blood pressure. In the U.S., heart disease is the leading cause of death and claimed more lives in 2021 than all forms of cancer and chronic lower respiratory disease combined. According to the American Heart Association, between 2017 and 2020, nearly 128 million adults, or about 49%, had some form of cardiovascular disease. So it's likely that many of us either know someone affected by heart disease or educate people that are affected by heart disease. While genetics and family history can certainly play a role in our risk for developing heart disease, um, the good news is that there are lifestyle behaviors that can significantly reduce the risk and nutrition plays a pretty big role. Uh, here on the slide, you can see the American Heart Association's essential eight health factors that affect uh, our risk for heart disease and stroke. Nutrition can directly affect five of these eight, specifically our diet, blood pressure, cholesterol, body weight, and blood sugar. And what's encouraging is that many Americans are looking to food to seek heart health benefits in a, a proactive and a protective way. According to IFIX 2023 Food and Health Survey on American Adults, 30% of those surveyed indicated that cardiovascular health um, affects their food choices. However, you know, as we know, there's still a disconnect when it comes to American eating patterns. Uh, as you can see on the right side of the slide here, the majority of Americans do not meet the recommended intake for foods like whole grains, vegetables, dairy, and fruit that are associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease. So at a time when there are just a variety of eating patterns and a variety of health advice, how can we as health professionals support our clients, um, our patients, and our communities with science-based guidance that meets their unique needs from a health, cultural, and food preference perspective. Now, with that question in mind, let's get started. Amy, over to you. 
Hi, everybody. I am so happy to be here with you today to share insights on culinary nutrition that can help us guide our patients and clients to better cardiovascular health and wellness, as well as enjoyment. So you've already heard about my background from Megan. I do want to share more about my disclosures. I work extensively with our food is food uh, system, and I am being compensated for speaking today by the National Dairy Council. So my background um, has had a very direct influence on my professional career path and on the tagline for my business, inspired by farmers, flavor, and fun. My dad was a farmer. He um, took over his dad's farm in Northeast North Dakota when he finished college. My dad was drafted for World War II in 1943. And yes, I was a late life surprise for my parents. Um, so my dad was drafted in 1943 and the draft board said, this young man is too sick to serve. And what they discovered is he had type one diabetes. So in the early days of care and treatment, my dad was struggling with that. He had two sisters who were nurses who were very helpful. And for his 21st birthday, his dad gave him a Harley Davidson. This is one of my dad's favorite memories to talk about. He unfortunately passed away of a massive heart attack at age 76. So he had lived quite well with um, type one diabetes until he didn't. My mom uh, was inspired to bring me into the kitchen and teach me about food and flavor when I was diagnosed with type one diabetes at age seven. She had a massive garden, she had a passion for cooking and learning, and she shared all those insights with me. And every time I'm in the kitchen, I am paying honor to my mom and all the amazing life lessons that she gave me. And the fun definitely inspired more so by my dad than my mom. My dad was a very joyful, joking, jolly fellow. And um, this was the last photo I ever took of him before he passed away in 2000. He was building a swing set um, from the trees and from rope and wood on the farm for his grandchildren. My mom passed away recently of a stroke. So given our family history of type one diabetes, my dad's passing of a massive heart attack and my mom passing of a stroke at 94. I think you can all appreciate why this issue of cardiovascular wellness is incredibly important to me, both personally and professionally. So our learning objectives today are fourfold. I want you all to be able to describe eating patterns that promote better cardiovascular outcomes, but that are also enjoyable and achievable for the long term. You should be able to describe some culinary nutrition principles and practices that contribute to wellness and enjoyment, identify some, some specific ingredients with an emphasis on nutrition, affordability, and convenience, because today's home cook does not want to spend a lot of time. And finally, we should all be able to better address consumer questions when there's myths and misinformations to help guide them to the evidence and to the best health outcomes based on healthful eating patterns. These are suggested practice competencies for my dietitian colleagues. Please choose whatever best suits your learning needs. So let's begin by talking about the science and cultures of eating patterns that promote health. There is no single eating pattern best suited to everyone, but there are traits that um, common around eating patterns that predict better health from all across the world. We're going to take a look at four patterns right now two that are based on culture, and two that were designed by researchers. So the Mediterranean style pattern and the Okinawan eating pattern, both designed by culture, based on the foods that were growing in those regions of the world, readily available, um, and could be accessed by people for many, many years to develop these eating patterns. Whereas the DASH diet and the MIND diet were developed by researchers, the DASH diet to see if you could have an eating pattern that was just as effective as medication in reducing blood pressure levels, and the MIND diet building on the Mediterranean pattern and the DASH pattern to see if you could slow neurodegenerative delay. So there are different foods that are associated with these eating patterns. You'll note that fruits and vegetables are prevalent among all of them, and some of them fermented dairy foods are especially prevalent, whole grains, nuts, healthful sources of fats and oils. On the bottom, you'll notice the stark differences in the macronutrient composition of the diets. The Okinawan diet has twice the carbohydrate as the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet has more than sixfold the amount of total fat. Yet despite these differences in macronutrient composition, 
these are still healthful patterns. And that's because of the whole foods that make up the eating patterns. The only numbers to pay close attention to and to think more critically about is the amount of potassium compared to sodium. So in the DASH and Okinawan, the two patterns for which we have great data, um, one because of design and one because of research, we see that the potassium level is much, much greater than the sodium level, which is in contrast to this typical American diet. I want you to be very wary of reductionist nutrition. Getting caught up in the numbers, the percentages, specific nutrients, even specific foods is a downfall to helpful guidance for our patients and clients about healthful patterns. It is not about an individual meal, an individual food choice. It is about the overall balance, variety, and complexity of that eating pattern that they choose to follow. So what is the best eating pattern? The best is in quotes, because again, this is not about a single diet that is the best for everybody, but the best eating pattern. Um, we have insights from the Pure Healthy Eating Index, which very powerful insights here, more than a are almost a quarter of a million people across 80 countries with very diverse socioeconomic status income levels. And this pattern, like many others that we've been looking at already, five servings of fruits and vegetables per day, two servings of dairy foods, notably most of that coming from whole milk or full fat dairy products, little over a serving of nuts per day, half a serving of legumes, and 0.3 servings of fish per day, or approximately the two servings that are part of our US dietary guidelines. So this type of pattern, um, very predictive of lower risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality in countries around the world, especially in lower income countries. So what are the most important points from the PURE study? Here's a quick distillation. The PURE diet score associations with cardiovascular disease were similar to the Mediterranean diet score and much stronger than the planetary health diet score, meaning patterns that compose that, that are composed of both plant and animal-based foods are more powerful than patterns that um, eliminate or dramatically reduce animal-based foods. Again, these findings were from diverse nations around the world, including low and middle-income countries. The dairy, mostly full fat, and we're gonna take a closer look at the research on full fat dairy and its role in health leading patterns in just a moment. And notably here, avoiding red meat did not strengthen the pure diet score. And I'll share a little bit of research at the end of this talk about the role of red meat, um, both beef and pork in healthful eating patterns. So healthful eating patterns do not have to be low in total fat. They can be as we see in the Okinawan pattern, but they do not have to be as we see in the Mediterranean pattern and in the pure um, healthy eating index. So I think one of the best known studies on the role of fat in dietary patterns that help reduce risk of cardiovascular outcomes, negative cardiovascular outcomes is the PREDIMED study, which was designed to see if diets higher in uh, sources of fat from olive oil and nuts like almonds, hazelnuts, and walnuts could be protective. For those of you who are familiar with the study, you already recognize that they enrolled subjects across Spain who were at higher risk of cardiovascular disease due to multiple risk factors, namely obesity, type 2 diabetes, elevated lipids, elevated um, blood pressure, metabolic syndrome. And the folks who were given that Mediterranean diet pattern with more of the fats in it had such uh, reduced risk, they ended this study early. So higher fat pattern, that is abundant in fruits, vegetables, other plant-based foods, along with dairy foods, lean sources of meat, seafood, had better outcomes than a low-fat diet. So if we think about sources of fat in the diet and how we talk about them, how we talk to ourselves about them, to those we may be eating with, to our patients and clients, we have to question what we've been telling people. As someone who lives in Northern California, I've been celebrating extra virgin olive oil for years. I love cooking with it. I love the aromas and flavors of extra virgin olive oil. I also love brie cheese. And brie is something that we should be also talking about in terms of healthful eating patterns, enjoyment and flavor. So what is the relationship between full fat dairy and cardiovascular disease risk? This first study that we're looking at is a systematic review, looking at total dairy in the diet, milk, cheese, and yogurt. And you see here that the risk is lower for cardiovascular disease for most 
um, of these studies. There's one finding on cheese by O'Sullivan et al. that found no difference in risk between those consuming um, more of it and less of it. So here the story starts to get interesting. Is there reduced risk of cardiovascular disease when there is more full fat dairy in the diet? Now let's take a, another look. We're moving ahead in time here. We went from a paper published in 2016 to one published in 2020. This was a systematic review of meta-analyses with very detailed um, data analysis that showed that full fat dairy had no impact on the risk of heart disease and that certain choices, including yogurt and cheese, may be protective against heart disease. The research on yogurt advanced so much that on March 1st of this year, the US Food and Drug Administration approved a qualified health claim for yogurt that I would like to read to you briefly. Eating yogurt regularly, at least two cups or three servings per day, may reduce the risk of type two diabetes according to limited scientific evidence. So the body of evidence has grown, but it's grown enough that the FDA agreed to this qualified health claim that you will start to see on yogurt in retail settings in the near future. Your patients and clients will notice this and will likely be asking you, you about it. All right, moving forward in the dairy research, looking at the role of full fat dairy. This was a randomized controlled trial with 72 participants with metabolic syndrome. Um, this carefully controlled trial included a four week run in period where dairy intake was limited to less than three servings per week of non fat milk. Then the participants randomly assigned to one of three diets that controlled diet that mimicked the run in diet a low fat dairy with 3.3 servings per day of low fat milk, yogurt or cheese for 12 weeks and the full fat dairy, 3.3 servings as you can see from the full fat milk, yogurt and cheese. This study suggests that when dairy fat is consumed as part of whole foods with a complex matrix, it does not adversely impact classic cardiovascular disease risk factors. So we're not saying butter on popcorn, we're saying dairy fat as part of that food matrix with milk, yogurt, and cheese. That food matrix is a very critical piece of this information on the role of dairy fat or dairy, uh, whole fat dairy foods like milk, yogurt, and cheese. When we look at the food matrix of something like milk or cheese, you can see that it's packaged with the, the macronutrients we recognize the micronutrients, but also these bioactives, which is a very interesting emerging area of research. Now you can look at the whole food, but then we also have to look at how is that whole food transformed when we take it into a kitchen or a food processing center. We chop it and break down cell walls in something like a tomato, for example. We sear a protein and we get changes in that outer layer. We ferment something like yogurt or cheese and that transforms the carbohydrate, reduces the amount of lactose, for example, in dairy foods, um, changes grapes into wine. We homogenize something and we distribute the fat throughout. We have leaching of minerals that come out through canning liquids or cooking liquids. So there's a lot of detailed science going on in this related to food science and related to how all the compounds and foods interact in our bodies. The cheese matrix, particularly interesting here. And again, those bioactives are the part of this story that we're just starting to figure out what potential effects they have. But when you are consuming cheese as part of a healthful eating pattern, we no longer need to be thinking about cardiovascular disease risk. We can think about potential benefits for reducing risk, um, but we can also think about enjoyment and how does cheese help people bring along other health promoting foods that can be eaten and enjoyed more often. I think about my husband and steamed broccoli, but, but if that steamed broccoli comes along with a little bit of mild cheddar, he's in it to win it. So cheese consumption and health effects. This here was a, an umbrella study and cheese consumption inversely correlated with many, <laughs> many factors here. I'm not gonna read through this. You can see the slide, but the bottom line here, the findings suggest that cheese consumption about an ounce to an ounce and a half per day has neutral to moderate benefits for human health. So we've got a qualified health claim for yogurt. We've got this body of evidence growing for the, the benefits of cheese for enjoyment as well as health benefits. So when a patient or client says to you, I had cheese pizza last night, what should your reaction be? 
My reaction is, that's awesome. What did you pair it with? Did you enjoy it with a leafy green salad? Did you have some other fruits and vegetables in there to accompany those amazing dairy ingredients? Was the crust made with potentially white whole wheat flour? This crust was, I made it in my home kitchen. So, you know, I think we have to be very mindful about the messages that we're giving so that we're giving people guidance and advice that they can integrate into their habits and integrate into their feelings and emotions about health and wellness. What should we be telling patients and clients about full fat dairy? They don't increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. They may reduce your risk of developing type two diabetes and they can be enjoyed as part of overall healthful eating patterns. So next concept here, health promoting eating patterns never need to eliminate entire food groups. We can eat a broad variety of food across all food groups to promote greater nutrient intake, which can in turn promote better health outcomes. Megan has already referenced the data on how we're doing in the United States in terms of food groups that are associated with reduced cardiovascular disease risk. You've already seen this data presented differently but we are not doing well in terms of meeting our daily goals for vegetables and all the subgroups of vegetables. We're not doing great for fruit. We're not doing great for dairy. We're not doing great for seafood. The one area where we are over consuming are refined grains. And when we think about risk factors in the diet for increasing risk of metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, those refined grains are foods that if they are exchanged for foods that provide these fruits, vegetables, dairy, seafood, for example, we're gonna have better health outcomes. We also have nutrients of public health concern. And again, I told you, be wary of reductionist nutrition, but we do need to think about these nutrients and the foods that provide them. So in terms of dietary fiber, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, this picture only shows the fresh fruits and vegetables, but dairy or dietary fiber also comes with the processed forms, the frozen, the canned, the dried. So that message of fresh is best, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but this was just a beautiful image I chose. It was not meant to suggest that fresh is best. In terms of calcium, potassium, and vitamin D, I bet you can guess what the hero food is in this category, fluid milk provides all three of these. So think about the power if we could get people to consume one more serving of dairy in terms of a glass of fluid milk each day. Maybe not as a glass, maybe on a bowl of cereal, maybe cooked into something they love eating and serving. So again, adding one more daily serving of dairy can have a powerful impact on filling those shortfall nutrient gaps but it's not just the dairy with the calcium, potassium, and vitamin D and milk, it's also that fiber. We have to be thinking about messages that help people to combine foods to make powerful pairings that provide nutrients as well as enjoyment. So looking at dairy foods, what are the powerful packages in the cheese, milk, and yogurt? You can see there are some differences here, but again, milk is the most powerful because of that full package with calcium, vitamin D, and potassium, along with 10 other nutrients. Cheese, yogurt, both good sources of calcium, a lot to celebrate here in terms of the overall nutrient package. And the nutrients that are listed are provided at at least 10% of the daily value per serving. That's why they are part of this story. There are other nutrients provided at lower levels that aren't listed on this slide. So as a farmer's daughter in North Dakota, does anybody wanna guess a side dish that my mom served probably four to six nights a week for the supper table in North Dakota? Yeah, this slide gives you a big hint, right? Mashed potatoes, they were growing on the farm. I grew up on the edge of the Red River Valley, huge potato growing region of the country. And we had mashed potatoes often made with 2% milk or reduced fat milk. I think they're a gateway to greater nutrient intake, but they're often a food that people um, say like, oh, I shouldn't or uh, those who can't be good for me, they're white foods. Well, think about the powerful package of these. The potatoes, especially the varieties that you can leave the thin skin on when mashing, providing fiber and potassium. That milk, again, the calcium, potassium, and vitamin D. This is something that if people like it and enjoy it, help them celebrate that. Help them realize they're getting another serving of vegetables, another serving of dairy. Okay. 
Again, be wary of reductionist nutrition, but if you wanna focus on a single nutrient to limit to promote better health outcomes, we need to help our patients and clients focus on limiting sodium intake. As Americans, we are very good at exceeding our sodium um, recommendations. 2300 is the recommended intake, the maximum for most of the population. However, many people it's recommended they get 1500 milligrams, certain subgroups of the population. On average, we're getting more than 3,400 milligrams per day. About 70% of that comes from restaurant and processed foods. Teenage boys are likely to have even much higher levels because of the food choices they tend to make most often. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimate that 40% of our sodium comes from nine different types of foods, things like pizza, burritos, deli meat sandwiches, where you take higher sodium ingredients like bread, meat, and cheese, and you layer them. I wanna focus on one um, of these items, poultry, to just give you a perspective on how I give people guidance. Because yes, we want people to consume less sodium, but we also have to recognize that people are dealing with choices based on the amount of time they can spend, the amount of money they can, set, they can spend, as well as sensory properties. What's the texture, flavor, enjoyment? Um, the NPD group has been tracking dietary intake in the United States by sending out 15-day uh, dietary uh, diaries. Now they do it online. But for 15 days, a member of the family tracks everything that everybody in the family eats. And then they send that back in. And NPD has been doing this since 1980. There is one food that has continued to increase in intake across the country, and it's fried chicken. Now, nobody claims to be eating fried chicken. Yet somehow the data is showing this continual increase. We as Americans love fried chicken. It can come in the form of nuggets, tenders, there's new restaurants popping up. If people like fried chicken, the message is great, enjoy it once in a while. What are you pairing with it? Are you getting the coleslaw? Are you getting the mashed potatoes? We also know that rotisserie chicken is popular because it is a loss leader in grocery stores. The price brings you into the store for that great deal on convenient, juicy, moist, flavorful chicken, it makes getting dinner on the table easy. And you can see here, these sodium comparisons are based on very small portions, just a little over three ounces. So the rotisserie chicken has half the sodium of the fried chicken. And by the way, nobody eats just three ounces of fried chicken. You could eat three ounces of rotisserie chicken, just the meat. Um, so now what about people who are cooking with that convenient frozen chicken that they have in the freezer, always available to help put dinner on the table? That is pumped with a sodium solution, which helps keep the chicken moist while cooking. Now, having it frozen means less likely that it's going to become food waste. It is always available. That fresh chicken, very low in sodium, but if you overcook it, all of a sudden something that's tender, moist, and juicy becomes something that is not enjoyable. And failure in the kitchen causes people to stop doing those things. Nobody wants to fail. So I'm a huge fan of the frozen chicken for people who are gonna cook. If somebody is buying rotisserie chicken, that's awesome. I encourage them to pair more vegetables with that meal, to have a glass of milk with that meal, to ensure that it's balanced and that it's helping develop a healthful eating pattern. What about salt? This is one of the most common questions I get. Many people have a fanciful view of um, sea salt, thinking that a sea salt that has a pink color, for instance, which comes from copper, well, it must be much lower in sodium. That is just not true. The difference in the amount of sodium for most sea salts is that the crystalline structure makes it less uh, dense. So you look at that fine grain iodized table salt, one teaspoon weighs six grams, the fine grain sea salt, 5.6 grams. That's why there's slightly less sodium there. Um, there is one type of salt at the bottom of this chart, kosher salt with a diamond crystal structure. These are open hollow crystals that are very light in weight. You can see a weight of this um, sodium chloride salt is 2.8 grams. That's why it's so low in sodium. And this type of product is the easiest thing for a home cook to use to reduce his or her sodium um, use in home cooking. This is also used in professional kitchens across the country. Um, when I worked for the Culinary Institute of America, this type of salt is what was in every teaching kitchen on that campus. The truth of the matter is people who add salt when cooking and add um, salt at the table, that's not where most of the salt is coming from. It's coming from 
those restaurant and processed foods and many restaurants are using processed foods to put meals in front of their diners. So it's those choices that they make where there are again, lots of intensely um, salted or foods with lots of sodium that cause problems. This leads to the question of how can we be more helpful? And I'll get there for a moment with when it comes to cheese. But draining and rinsing canned beans is an example of an easy technique that can reduce sodium content by about 30%. So think about something like a bean and cheese burrito you're gonna make at home and you're gonna make those refried beans with canned pinto beans. Um, you drain and rinse them, you remove 30% of the salt, you maybe add a sofrito or some salsa to flavor them a little bit more, a little bit of maybe um, olive oil or peanut oil to cream them out a little bit, you add some cheese, delightful, delicious, dish rich in fiber and potassium from the beans, as well as um, calcium, some protein from the cheese. But what about that cheese? What about cheese and sodium? Here again, it's a matter of perspective. What ingredient are you choosing and how is it going to be used to add flavor and deliciousness to that dish? If people are choosing fresh cheeses like ricotta or cottage, there's lots of water in there and less sodium. If you're choosing a soft ripened cheese, something like brie, moderate water, moderate sodium. And then if you're choosing a hard aged cheese like Parmesan, there's very little water, there's more sodium, lots and lots of umami, which brings along that savory deliciousness. So there's no right answer here. What is the best cheese? They're all great, but can be used in different ways for different purposes to create a healthful eating pattern, to create deliciousness, to add creamy mouthfeel. So let's go back and look at that cheese pizza again. Admittedly a very adult cheese pizza, but it incorporates those three types of cheeses, that soft water rich ricotta that is that beautiful creamy vibrant white on this. The mozzarella that develops more of the browning and gives that cheese pull that people like and associate with pizza. And then Parmesan cheese along the crust so that that white whole wheat flour used in that crust because something that people will eat and enjoy because of the umami, that savoriness versus something that, you know, little kids like to leave the crust behind. My husband is a little kid. So it's just one of my strategies for bringing him along on this ride to better cardiovascular wellness. Okay, final section here. There are no superfoods, only super eating patterns. And super eating patterns include foods from all food groups. One of the foods that a lot of people want to or try to omit from their diet when they're learning about a new diagnosis is red meat. I have lots and lots of neighbors and, and friends um, here in Sacramento. Um, who tell me, my doctor told me I just, um, I have higher cholesterol and I need to stop eating red meat. That is not great guidance. What we need to be talking to people about is how much and how often and the type of red meat. So this is research, a randomized controlled investigator blinded study with 41 subjects, half of whom were obese, comparing a Mediterranean style pattern with red meat, meaning lean unprocessed beef and pork, or a Mediterranean controlled diet, which did not have red meat. There was chicken and um, other poultry and seafood included in that pattern. And it was very interesting to note that total cholesterol decreased more on the Mediterranean red pattern compared to the control. So it decreased on both patterns, but more in the Mediterranean red. The LDL decreased on the Mediterranean red, but not on the med control. Other outcomes were similar. And so what is it about the red meat? It's that full food matrix, that full nutrient package. Um, I expect to see more research on this because the investigators in this study were actually startled by the findings. And so, you know, this is a message of for patients and clients who enjoy red meat, encourage them to choose unprocessed lean beef and pork. So, can a cheeseburger be a healthful choice as part of a healthful eating pattern? Absolutely. Look at this mushroom Swiss burger. If the patty is lean beef, if the cheese is a delicious drape of Swiss cheese, if the mushrooms have been sauteed and flavored, the sesame seeds on the bun, adding some seeds for extra fiber, this becomes something that we should encourage and celebrate. What else gets paired with it? I'd pair this with some berries for dessert. So here's a little more culinary inspiration for everybody. 
ways to incorporate lean beef and dairy with other foods so you get these powerful pairings, you get a powerful nutrient package, you get deliciousness, you get things that people wanna try and enjoy again and again. So how many people out there celebrate Taco Tuesday? How about spicy shredded beef street tacos where the beef is braised with onions and beer and some spicy uh, chilies, chipotles and adobo, and you get spicy beef that shreds, you get this creamy cilantro coleslaw, you have the choice of adding cheese to this if you'd like, a little drizzle of crema perhaps, really craveable, delicious option. This can also be turned into a bowl served over beans and rice, for example. Speaking of bowls, the Italian-inspired beef and farro bowl, taking a whole grain like farro, that delicious, chewy, slightly nutty flavored whole grain, and then topping it with different fruits and vegetables, Parmesan cheese, perfectly cooked medium rare flank steak. So many options for bowl recipes that make them customizable so that all the people out there making dinner for the family don't have to worry about being a short order cook, but the person at the table can customize for his or her own needs. If somebody in the family says, I'm not eating meat anymore, mom. Great, why don't we put on some chickpeas with your bowl? All right, again, there are no superfoods. Those of you out there who know me well um, know that I rage against kale and it's kind of a joke. I eat kale, everybody relax. But in this discussion, when people wanna go down the path of what is the best or this is the best or this is a superfood, my response is always, well, what is the best depends on the person and the situation. So let's take the example of the mom who has bought the rotisserie chicken and is thinking about a side dish. And she looks at that bag of fresh um, triple washed baby spinach. And she says, oh, that's easy. That's an easy way to get a quick salad on the table. I celebrate that. But then what about the person who doesn't shop as often and is worried about food waste and he or she chooses the frozen chopped spinach. It's half the price per serving of the baby spinach. And admittedly, three quarters of a cup of frozen chopped spinach is a lot more spinach than a one cup of fresh baby spinach. It condenses very quickly. It's very low effort. Both choices are great. And when we're thinking about people who are food insecure or budget insecure, we have to think about not only the effort cost, but the price cost. If we look at something like a fresh head of whole broccoli, there's moderate effort there because you have to have some knife skills. You have to have a cutting board. You have to have a knife. You have to know how to attack that. But what about that frozen broccoli that's in the steam and bag? It's a product I use quite often because it is the very easiest way to get that broccoli steamed for my husband on which I put the mild cheddar cheese, but that's a higher price point. Then if we look at something like frozen collard greens that can be dropped into a soup at the end of cooking that soup to add a dark leafy green in a very approachable way. So I think, you know, again, don't fall victim to the fresh is best. Think about the best option being it depends on cost, availability. How, you can't eat it unless it's in your home ready to be prepared and enjoyed. The effort is a huge, huge deal for people. I've done lots and lots of work with the produce industry, and one of the biggest barriers to consuming produce is the effort that it takes. Even peeling a navel orange is overwhelming for some people. Knowing how to cut up something like um, you know, a whole head of broccoli, these are overwhelming things, so we need to help people find ways to get products that are more approachable and easy for them so they can integrate them into their eating patterns. What about the best dairy foods? So again, I look at this in terms of price and also enjoyment. What's gonna get people to add another serving of dairy? So as someone with type one diabetes, I tend to choose ultra filtered milk because it has lower carbs and higher protein. I get a better glycemic response. And ultra filtered chocolate milk is especially delightful for me when I want a sweet treat that has enough protein in it to balance out and attenuate that glycemic response. If we're looking at something like, um, should I choose whole milk ricotta or part skim ricotta? There's not a lot of difference in the calories there, right? There is a difference in the carbs. So how's that gonna be used? That pizza that I showed you earlier used whole milk ricotta because I'm already getting carbs from the crust. So again, thoughtful choices based on a number of different factors and giving guidance depending on where that patient or client is coming from, what he or she needs. 
If you want to get somebody to drink milk who for years has said, I don't like milk because they think that the only milk they should be drinking is skim milk. If you can move them to reduced fat or whole milk, look at the price of that. Eminently affordable at 24, 25 cents per glass on average across the United States. If someone wants to choose organic milk, that's fine. Just note that the price is three times as much. The issue of lactose intolerance has kept a lot of people from eating and enjoying dairy foods. And I think they perhaps don't realize all of the options out there that the dairy industry has thoughtfully provided, particularly lactose-free dairy milk, that makes it easy for people with lactose intolerance to make a choice so they can eat and enjoy or drink and enjoy dairy foods without the GI discomfort. There are also dairy foods that have less uh, less lactose per serving. And you can look at, you know, something like a quarter or a half cup of cottage cheese with just over three grams. Maybe they start with a quarter cup of cottage cheese. You know, I think we have to help people again, find ways to start incorporating more dairy back into their diets. If they're thinking that the only answer for lactose intolerance is avoiding dairy, it's not. Those fermented dairy products have less of the lactose because the good bacteria that does the fermentation chews up some of the lactose and converts it into um, compounds that create delicious flavor in fermented dairy products. So in summary, and making sure that we are leaving ample time for your questions, I wanna share four points for you. The principles and practices of cooking all a heart focus on four areas. The first, focus on flavor. The taste and flavor is the number one factor in why we as humans choose the foods we do the most often. Yes, there are some of us dietitians who do crazy things like I'll eat Chinese bitter melon, um, but most of us choose things because we like the way they taste. And so when we're talking with our patients and clients about dairy in particular, if they enjoy a dairy product that has more fat or is whole milk, whole fat dairy product, reinforce that that choice is okay. It's not going to increase risk of cardiovascular disease. If it's a fermented product like full fat, whole milk yogurt, it may reduce risk of type two diabetes. If it gets them to eat something like yogurt and berries for breakfast more often, to drink a glass of milk more often, to add cheese to vegetables and eat vegetables more often, let's help them celebrate that. The second, prioritize plants. We need to get people to eat more plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, seeds, nuts. And can dairy come along for the ride and help make that more delicious, more enjoyable, more nutrient rich? Absolutely. Pick powerful proteins. This doesn't just mean animal proteins. It means plant-based proteins as well, but pick powerful proteins. Pick milk, pick cottage cheese, pick legumes, pick salmon. Pick chicken, pick powerful proteins and pair them with other foods to build those healthful eating patterns. If you're choosing red meat, choose lean unprocessed red meat most of the time. And embrace enjoyment. This mostly relates to sweet treats. Um, and this is something that as someone with type one diabetes, I rarely have them, but when I do, I want them to be the best quality. My co-author on Cooking All a Heart, Linda, has a sweet treat every day. She loves baking. And so we really wanted to help people find ways to embrace enjoyment for dessert, but embrace enjoyment of all eating occasions. I'm now gonna show you some images to give you a little more inspiration. So this recipe is one of the most popular recipes Linda and I put in our book. Um, it is so simple. You take two cans of chickpeas that are drained and rinsed, one can of diced tomatoes. You add a little bit of lemon juice, a little honey, some oregano, and feta cheese. You mix everything in the same pot or pan that you're going to bake it in. You bake it for 45 minutes. It comes out of the off oven, cools slightly. If you have some nice crusty bread for sopping up the sauce, that's one of my husband's favorite things to do. He gets really excited about this meal because the sauce is so flavorful. This is easy, approachable. I like it even better the next day when the flavors marry, low cost, delicious. And yes, can you pair it with other things? Absolutely. Can it be a side dish? Absolutely. A peach caprese salad with burrata is a little esoteric and higher end, 
but this is a pairing of fruit and dairy. I do this in the winter with canned peaches from peach trees here in California, processed locally, and I combine it with cottage cheese. It's the same concept, something sweet with that creamy dairy to create a delicious, enjoyable experience, but a peach caprese salad with burrata in the peak of summer when peaches are at their perfection. Oh, yes. Shiitake and spinach quiche. So I think that mashed potatoes are a gateway to greater nutrient intake. I think that eggs are a greater uh, a gateway to greater vegetable intake. So if you can get patients and clients to think about egg baked dishes for breakfast or brunch, something that you can maybe bake in a nine by 13 pan on a Sunday and have a breakfast ready to go to heat in the microwave every morning that includes eggs, vegetables, dairy, that's a home run to help people get out the door with something that is satiating, delicious, nutrient rich. Smoked salmon flatbread with dill. Again, this is another kind of higher end approach to getting more seafood. But for people who love smoked salmon, what does this come along with? It comes along with the whole grain flatbread. It's paired with those thinly sliced cucumbers, a little bit of onion, capers, fresh dill. You've got aromas, flavors, textures, food groups that come together for something rather magical. Berries with cannoli cream. Cooking All a Heart was a book first published in the 1980s as part of a National Institute of Health funded cardiovascular research study. This is the only recipe that has been included in all four versions of the book, and it's because it is so delicious and so simple. It's ricotta cheese sweetened with just a wee bit of powdered sugar. It is accompanied by these beautiful berries. There's a little bit of orange zest for aromatic hit, a little bit of dark chocolate and pistachio. Eminently satisfying, beautiful, easy, elegant. What's the shortcut approach to berries with cannoli cream? Berries with Greek yogurt. Easy, delicious. It's the breakfast I have most days this time of year. So it has been my pleasure to share culinary nutrition for heart health from science to plate with all of you. I'm now going to turn it back to Megan and she's going to lead us through the Q&A. All right. Wow. Thank you, Amy, for an excellent presentation. Who else is hungry for lunch, right? Those images were just gorgeous. Um, so before we transition to questions, I have a few notes I want to share. Um, so here are some resources we thought might be helpful builds for this topic on heart health and dairy nutrition. For the sake of time, I'm going to move on, but just know that these are in here um, in the copy of the slides that you have. Right. And if you enjoyed this presentation, we do have a library of free resources on our website. I wanna note that our bone health webinar is about to expire. So if you're interested in learning about bone health and want that CEU, you have just a few days left to get it while it lasts. And before we get into the q and I also wanna note that when we reviewed the registration information, we received a lot of questions related to dairy on topics that go far beyond cardiometabolic health, such as addressing common myths, dairy's role in other health outcomes, farming practices, sustainability, um, for those folks, I highly encourage you to check out our June webinar, Talk Dairy to Me. We covered a lot of these common questions, so this can be a helpful resource on how you can answer the questions that you may hear. Right, and finally, we kindly ask that you complete the post-webinar survey. We take your feedback so seriously, and it helps us to improve our educational content. Also, if we don't get to your question, um, you can also leave it in the survey along with your contact information. Otherwise, the survey is totally anonymous. Um, lastly, as a reminder, the CEU certificate from CDR will be provided in the Zoom follow-up email tomorrow. And all right, um, for those of you who submitted your question in the registration process, thanks so much. We had thousands of registrants and did our absolute best to review all of the questions and incorporate them into the presentation right now. So um, we're gonna take the next few minutes to address the ones that were most commonly asked, most relevant to this topic of cardiometabolic health. Um, and then time permitting, we will get to the questions that were submitted live in the chat today. So without further ado, let's get started with the, the common registration questions. Um, so Amy, how do you communicate the benefits of whole milk dairy foods while also providing guidance around energy balance? So I always start when I have these conversations with people asking them, you know, what are you currently enjoying? What are your pr personal preferences when it comes to mouthfeel, protein content, et cetera? So, um, you know, thinking about somebody who likes to start their day with yogurt, I ask, well, do you include half and half in your coffee, for example? 
And for them, I'd say, okay, why don't you start with a Greek yogurt? You get a creamier mouthfeel, you get higher protein and go with a reduced fat or fat-free Greek yogurt. For someone like me with type one diabetes, when it comes to fluid milk, I ask about affordability in a gentle, respectful manner. And if, if they can afford the ultra processed, I will often recommend that because of the lower carb, higher protein. Um, for someone who loves cheese on vegetables, for my husband, I encourage him to choose 1% or skim milk. You know, so it's all about providing that fat flexibility, asking about personal preference, and also thinking about powerful proteins. Is there something else that can go along with a lower fat choice if calories are a consideration, or does it just not matter? I'll give one more example with my husband. He loves ice cream. He would always, if I weren't coaching him, put two scoops of ice cream in a bowl. I always say half ice cream, half fruit. That could be bananas, berries, peaches in the summer. So that's how I think about um, flexibility when it comes to whole milk dairy foods in healthful eating patterns. Love that. No, great, great talking points. Thank you, Amy. All right. Another question that commonly came up was um, when it comes to cardiometabolic health, how do we address questions we may receive regarding, you know, dairy foods versus non-dairy alternatives? This is one where you have to be really respectful of the information that people are coming at you with. Is it based on science? Is it based on misinformation? I found that more often than not, it's based on misinformation. And that as a healthcare professional, I always want to lead with the science and evidence while being respectful of people's choices. Um, what does their overall eating pattern look like? How can it be improved if there are gaps in nutrients, gaps in whole food groups? And, you know, the bottom line is we need to respect people's choices, but we need to share science-based information with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always a balance. Great point. All right, so um, for people with lactose intolerance, dairy food allergy, or who follow a vegan diet, um, what do you recommend uh, for those folks? Yeah, well, let's, let's start with lactose intolerance. If it is a true intolerance issue versus um, some other issue that's causing GI distress, um, then I talk to them about the lactose content of different foods. I talk to them about lactose-free dairy products. I talk to them about the little pills that you can take um, before enjoying a, a more lactose-rich dairy product. If it's a dairy food allergy, I take that very seriously and, and coach on, well, I should say I don't work in this area of dairy food allergies, but if it comes to an allergy, I refer to an expert who can guide somebody through those um, choices that are going to be the safest and that are also going to create an eating pattern that is not going to create nutrient deficit deficits. When it comes to vegan diets, um, I think that if you are really, really thoughtful and well-trained, you can do this well if this is your choice. If people are um, asking about dairy alternatives for vegan diets, I always guide them to soy milk because it is most similar to dairy milk in terms of its nutrient package. And again, I approach this with a lot of respect and a lot of thoughtful questioning about what's going to be most helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amy. Really appreciate that thoughtful response. Um, all right. So this is a fun one. Um, we receive a lot of questions like this, you know, as a nutrition communicator, um, what advice do you have to help us address misinformation and promote evidence-based advice? This is a huge challenge in a world where nearly everyone is engaged in social media, um, in a lot of platforms or channels on social media. Everybody's an expert because we all eat. But even before social media, when I was in graduate school in the mid-1990s studying nutrition communication, there's misinformation everywhere. You hear it in different settings. You hear it from family and friends. And so one of the things that I've realized over the years is that some people are never going to change their, their mind or change their views on certain issues in our food system. Those are the polar extremes, maybe 10% on either end of a bell-shaped curve. But the 80%, I, I refer to them as the movable middle. These are people who are actually really curious and want the expert guidance. 
from registered dietitian nutritionist, from nursing professionals, from other healthcare professionals, their own personal physician. They want us to share the best guidance with them because there's innocence, there's confusion. And when you can soothe someone's stress in this crazy, crazy world with some guidance that respects their values, respects their lifestyle and gives them the evidence that's gonna um, predict the best health outcome, they will come back to you again and again. And I've seen this so many times just in my recent life with people who are innocently struggling. And once they realize, oh, Amy's a dietitian and she's willing to share some of her expertise with me. Um, I've gotten a lot of lovely feedback recently, most recently from my own hairdresser. <laughs> awesome, thank you. And I will just add, you know, for the clinicians on here, every voice matters. So you know, feel confident in your voice to stand up and point out things online or with friends. Um, every voice matters, so I encourage you to do that. All right, so when it comes to culinary nutrition, uh, what's a common misconception or something you just wish more people knew? Um, yeah, this is something that I already addressed and mentioned a few times in my earlier comments. The notion that fresh is best so when I worked for the Culinary Institute of America, I worked with hundreds of chefs from around the world who um, would always say the fresh this is best, the fresh that is best. And, you know, as somebody who wants to make nutrition accessible, affordable, convenient, fresh is not always best. So thinking about the power of having a canned option in your pantry, a frozen option in your freezer, having things that are shelf stable and available for use when you want to, you know, prepare a healthful meal. Th this is critically important. I'm also concerned about food waste in this country and what foods get wasted most often, highly perishable foods, meat, poultry, seafood, dairy products, unfortunately, are at the top of that list. So of course we want freshness in dairy foods, right? We want great quality, great flavor, but the notion of fresh is best, particularly when it comes to fruits and vegetables, I kind of rage against that because I want people eating more foods that are gonna give better cardiovascular outcomes. I want people to have more options that are affordable and available. So have I, have I hit the, the nail on the head enough on this one? I mean, I'm hammering away on this message. All forms of foods that are minimally processed that can create healthful eating patterns are beneficial for us to support and promote and help people appreciate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The nutritious foods are the nutritious ones that you're gonna eat and that works for your lifestyle and budget and everything else. So thank you, really appreciate that too. All right, so let's move to some of the questions from the live Q and A and a lot came in. So just give me a minute while I um, pull them up on my screen and we've been kind of filtering them through. I know you answered a lot in your presentation. Um, Okay, so here's one, and I know you, you talked about overall dietary patterns in the food matrix, but how would you address questions from clients on the saturated fat content, content in whole fat dairy foods? I guess, do you have a few talking points you would use um, with clients or patients? Absolutely. So, you know, the, the evidence in this area of research says that when you replace refined carbohydrates that have um, an impact on metabolic health, with saturated fat, there's neutral, um, oh, gosh, I'm not saying this very well. In terms of cardiovascular wellness, you are better off having saturated fat in your diet than refined carbohydrate. So getting somebody to take, this is gonna be a really dumb example, but to take that glazed donut from breakfast and to have a container of full fat Greek yogurt, that person's gonna have a much better cardiovascular outcome if they do that consistently over time. Um, here's another one that kind of gets into culinary nutrition. I would love to hear your take on using butter and ghee as cooking fats. So thoughts on, um, cooking fats like butter and ghee. I use butter very infrequently. Once in a while, I choose it because of the flavor, but, um, the pure butter fat does not have the same benefits or neutral effects as dairy fat or butter fat incorporated into milk, cheese, and yogurt. Um, so when it comes to me guiding people on the best oils and fats for cooking, um, if it is affordable for them, I will recommend a high quality extra virgin olive oil. If it is somebody for whom cost is a concern, I recommend peanut oil, has a very high smoke point neutral flavor. 
Um, mm -hmm. I don't recommend canola oil and that shocks a lot of people. And the reason that I don't is canola oil has alpha linolenic acid, which can go rancid very quickly. And a rancid oil is one of the most offensive things that you can use in your cooking. It makes nothing taste better. So you have to be very thoughtful about how quickly you use it. So that's why mm -hmm. I recommend peanut oil. It is so shelf stable. I didn't, I didn't know that. Um, okay, this might um, apply to that table you had in the beginning of the slideshow on the different um, healthy dietary patterns. So while I understand the nutrients from milk like vitamin D and calcium, how do you explain those who are vegan tend to have lower risk of cardiovascular and diabetic disease? I'm thinking Adventists and how they eat. Can you expand on your thoughts? Um, for these kind of dietary patterns? Yeah, you know, I think we have to look at the bigger picture there. And I'm not super familiar on the research with the Adventists, but certainly having lived in Southern California near those communities, what I witnessed was um, folks in those populations um, were much more slender than the rest of us. And certainly body weight has an implication for metabolic um, outcomes, cardiovascular disease risk. Um, one of the, the findings that I learned from Dr. Frank, who at Harvard years ago, when he and I were working on a project in Singapore, is that populations in Asia who tend to be thinner than populations in um, North America or Europe, at lower BMI, they are at higher risk of cardiovascular disease risk. So the, you know, the implications of the body weight and levels of obesity and cardiovascular disease risk is very interesting to me. But I think the mm -hmm. vegans, um, the vegan people following vegan dietary patterns, if they tend to be slender, I think that is one of the biggest confounding factors in why that eating pattern uh, is protective. Okay, awesome. Well, we are one minute over time, so I just want to remind everyone in the in the survey, if we didn't get to your question and you would like, you know, us or Amy to answer, just please. Um, leave your question and contact information. Again, the survey is anonymous, so we won't know how to reach you if you have a question. So leave your best contact information. So with that being said, Amy, thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation as always. It was so nice having you and everyone. Thank you so much for joining. We hope to see you again at our next webinar. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay healthy. Thank you.